weekend. We've, We've been the last four weeks preaching in other churches, churches and um, it's, it's always, always good to be home, home again too. too. But, but we're spoiled, Marianne and I. We've got two homes now, one in the Mid-North and, of course, here in Whangarei. I'd, I'd just like, like to share a testimony, testimony um, before I go, to, I'd like you all to welcome today a, a, a young lady, a daughter of Kai Kaui, just sitting behind uh, uh, Sister Masuku, by the name of Bodine. Uh, we had a Bible study the other day, and she's here with us today, so welcome home, Bodine. It's good to see you. I'd always like to share a testimony, and um, some of you uh, know this particular person, and uh, he often sat about uh, where uh, Sister Masuku is, and uh, he rang me one evening to say, Pastor, he says, can you come and do Bible study with me? He said, uh, oh, I'm, not, I'm not very good. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So I arranged the time, went to see him. And uh, he lives in Otangarei. And pe- most of you, some of you know him as uh, Charles Markini. Christmas Eve, he um, put himself into the Whangarei Hospital with very bad kidney pain. And, and they, they found, found out that his, uh, he had, had kidney, kidney trouble. And, and uh, over a period of time, they were able to, to get him right again. But his rehabilitation took a long time. And he, and he decided himself, because he's such a shy person, to designate his uh, own caregiver, a uh, lady he knew. But unfortunately, she didn't use the money to pay his bills and accounts, got behind and got himself into a terrible state. He ended up... Well, well, the, the only, only thing, thing that he had was his, well, well other, other things in his house, house but the only thing that he really cared about was the Bible that Jordan, our Bible worker, gave him. And he used to go and take it to bed because he was so lonely. Today, uh, I'm standing with him again. And um, thanks to the, the uh, generosity of our brothers within the church, he's got a TV now and he's watching 3, 3 ABN, Hope and First Light. Amen. You know, and, and the reason why I tell this story is because there are people in our community who are suffering and who need Jesus Christ more than what we could imagine. And it's just a blessing to see the other day as I called on him, he'd just been watching um, the Hope Channel and he was watching uh, the subject on, on death by one of our uh, ministers in the States and he was just so excited because it, he said it's exactly the same what you told me. And isn't it great to know that our message goes around the whole globe. And it doesn't matter where you are, the message is the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right, before we start, I'd just like to ask another prayer upon uh, the word today. If you just uh, bow your heads. Dearest Heavenly Father, we'd just like to say thank you that we can be in your house today. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit will uh, close us in, Lord, keep us safe, and may your Spirit be able to talk to me as we hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start my sermon this morning off reading from the book of Galatians chapter 5. The book of Galatians chapter 5 for of those of you who have your Bible. Galatians chapter 5 reading from verse 18. And it says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. But if you are led... By the Spirit, you are not under the law. Thirty years ago, as a new Christian, I used to get quite annoyed at some of these other Christians out there. Thirty years ago, Mary and I had come into the church and we were so in love with Jesus Christ as we are today, even more so, and so in love with this this beautiful uh, knowledge that we'd found out about the Sabbath And then all of a sudden, someone comes out of one of those particular quarters and says, you're not under the law, it's been nailed to the cross. And that used to send shivers up my back because I didn't know how to answer them. And, you know, um, it would come quite regularly. As soon as I'd heard it, one week, a couple of weeks would go by and Satan would again bring someone else into my life and say the same thing. And I said, man, that really, really annoyed me. And, you know... When I, when, I, when I think about that, all those people were doing was just mimicking the leaders and other peoples within their denomination. You're not under the law. It's been nailed to the cross. Today, I know how to, how to defend myself in that regards. But if you just took a walk down Bank Street here and visited all those churches from here south, you'd encounter that same 
uh, that same comment, that same statement. If we started just at our neighbors here, you are not under the, the law. It's been nailed to the cross. Continue to the Baptist, you hear the same thing. Continue down the road to the Presbyterians. Not, maybe not so much, but around the corner is the Pentecostal Elam Church. And this is where you have it. Again, the Christian renewal. All quoting, you are not under the law. Uh, it's been nailed to the cross. What an excuse is that? And that's all it is. It's an excuse. Because then you say, okay, then, if we're not under the law, then it's okay for me to go and commit adultery. Oh, no. No, it's not. Oh, oh well, then it's okay, then, if I'm not under the law, it's okay for me to steal from you, to take your car, have a joy ride in your car. Oh, no. Well, you just said, oh, I'm not under the law. Isn't it amazing how everything else is okay, but it's an excuse for them not to keep the Holy Sabbath day. Amazing, isn't it? It's an excuse for them not to keep the Sabbath day. The devil has blinded them through the leaders of those churches not to keep um, the Sabbath day. And, you know, when you, when you just hear that comment, you know, oh, we're not under the laws being nailed to the cross, it is so flippant and so irresponsible for them to be teaching something like that. Right? And I'll explain as I go along. And, you know, too, when someone verbalizes a statement like that, it reminds me, too, how careful we have to be in just throwing comments out there about the belief or spirit of prophecy. We just have to be so careful that we don't take anything out of context to become a stumbling block for those who are following Jesus Christ. But when you think about that, when you think about that flippant statement, you know, the, the law of God has been nailed to the cross, you know, we're not under the law anymore, and you try and visualize that, is it like that all of a sudden a Roman soldier grabs the particular law, walks over to the cross where Jesus is either laying on or hanging on at that particular stage, and then nails it to the cross? Is that what it's talking about? You'd think so, the way they talk, and so flippantly put it out there, wouldn't you? But I heard a great... Great statement here in the Sabbath school last week from our, our sister Pat, when she said, "How could you la nail stone to the stone to the cross? You can't, can you? It would break." But then, in in a slight regards, that statement is not all untrue. Because when you realise what was nailed to the cross, it was the law, wasn't it? But it was the law embodied and personified in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because the law is the law of love and he put himself on the cross for you and me. That's the only law I know that was nailed to the cross. And of course, there's also the Mosaic law. But even in saying the Mosaic law, it was put away with. Or another, another reference we have to the law of Moses, the word of ordinances. But not all of that was put away. Because we still have the law of hygiene, don't we? The law of health, that's still valid today. But the law of ordinances, the law of festivals, um, which all pointed to Jesus Christ, they've been put away with. Amen? Okay, let's carry on. A, state, a thing that was also practiced um, back then in the time of the Jews and Jesus was that to nullify a covenant or a particular contract was that they would na put a nail through that particular contract or that piece of paper that was, um, that was um, standing at the particular time. And of course, this reference to something to be nailed to is also the Jews trying to get rid of Jesus. They wanted him out of the way. So they also used that same reference as to nail something to the cross. The law's been done away with, so they didn't have to worry about the, fine, uh, th the love of the law that Jesus was talking about, that made it such a burden that, uh, that no one wanted to know anything about it. Let's just go back to our text again in, in Galatians. But if you le be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. You know, when you start to take, take that apart about uh, if you are led of the Spirit, that's a real powerful statement. And what does that require from us to be led by the Spirit? It's 
It's something that we have to practice on a daily bo basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, because otherwise we are under the law. If we're not building that relationship, and I don't know how many times you've heard me say that, you'll hear it a lot more too, that if we're not building that relationship with Jesus Christ, and we are not getting connected to the Spirit, then we remain under the law and the result of the law. When we just back up a few verses in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse, verse 14, it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Walk constantly, every day, connected to your Savior, Jesus Christ. For the flesh lusts is against the spirit. Everything we do is against the spirit of God. That's why we need constant repentance, constant forgiveness. For the flesh lust is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The flesh lusts is against the spirit. So everything you do under the flesh wars against the spirit of God. But the spirit also wars against it and is trying for you to have the strength to overcome the, 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 uh, the law of the flesh. Let's just keep going as we read this particular verse, th these particular verses. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these? And it's interesting to note as we read these in what category they actually fit in uh, into, uh, into life. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness and you know when you just read those those four particular uh, works of the flesh they're all pertaining to sexual sinfulness adultery fornication uncleanness and lasciviousness I had to look that 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 word up and uh, it means to uh, feeling or reveal an overt and often offensive sexual Desire. So, isn't it amazing, though, that the, the 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 sins that war against the flesh are sexual inhibitions? Goes on to say, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. I'll just back up a bit too. You know, isn't it amazing? You know how the other people out there say you're not under the law, and uh, and pro the most prominent problems they have in the other churches, and unfortunately it's crept into ours, is adultery. So sad, isn't it? Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. These ones, what category do they come under? They come under the relationship that we have with our God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Idolatry against God, witchcraft against God, hatred opposite to the love of God. Variance means to, um, hang on, I just checked what I, that came up as, to be inconsistent or divergent um, in our relationship, to emulate God in another way that's uh, not, not in accordance to his will, to be angry, strife, seditions, heresies, all sins against our relationship or worship of God. Verse 21 and because, you know, these are the sins of the flesh, nothing to do with the Spirit of God. Envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't it interesting that those last ones that we read are in our relationship to one another, to be envious of one another, to murder, to be drunk, uh, to be fighting, and such like. Interesting categories that the the the, uh, the lust of the flesh are put under. But then he underlines it right at the beginning. If we practice such things, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Powerful, isn't it? 
So that's how, how pitiful and how weak it is when someone says to you, you're not under the law, but you're under the Spirit. If you're, not, if you're practicing any of these, then the Spirit is a long way away from you, but still calling you, still calling you. Don't forget that. Then it goes on to say, then it goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, we need so much more love for one another. We need so much more, you know, to be arrogant and to be, uh, to be unkind and not welcoming to people uh, is not a spirit, uh, is, is, a, is a fruit of the spirit. We need the spirit of love. We need joy. And I praise the Lord that I'm allowed to experience joy on a daily basis as I study with different people. The joy of the Lord is something we all need in our lives. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Amen. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk uh, in, in the Spirit of God. As we, as we just think about, again, about our statements in regards to, um, you know, not being under the law, it says in the book of Matthew, uh, verse 5, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 19. And if we could just turn there, please. Matthew, chapter 5, reading from, first of all, we'll read from verse 17 and then go down to verse 19. Think not, in verse 17, it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. When Mary and I found out about the change of the Sabbath from Sabbath to, su uh, to Sunday, the, the chap who I went to ask for advice, he said, he pointed this verse out, you know. Daniel 7.25 says, For in the last, for man will think himself able to change God's laws and commandments. But then he says, Unless the earth move one jot or one tittle, and no wise will the law of God be changed till the very end, till it's all completed. Here we have another powerful statement from Jesus in verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. We are to uphold the law of God, not to put it away um, through any rash statement or any um, just comment that we make. The law is important for us, but we do are uh, only free of the law when we are so connected with the Spirit of God. I'll just try and just find another text that I was wanting to refer to. Um, I just can't see my that text particularly here. But remember when Jesus talks about that, if we're not connected to the vine, and he says, um, you know, we have to be connected to Jesus Christ. He is that, that vine that we are to be connected to because that's where we, are, where we get our power from. And he says, you know, the fruits of the Spirit are not a matter of going out and getting disciples. The fruits of the Spirit are these that we just mentioned in the book of Galatians. Joy, love, and peace. When we have those fruits working in our lives, then we are equipped to be the disciples of Jesus Christ. We can't go out there with, with sin in our hearts, being jealous of someone, being reveling against someone, being adulterous to someone. We cannot represent the, law, uh, the Spirit of God like that, can we? But if we've got love, joy, and peace in our hearts, we have the fruits of the Spirit, and uh, we are equipped to be his disciples. Amen. Let's also just turn across to the book of Exodus in chapter 20. You know where I'm going, as I mentioned that particular verse. Because let's look at the law of God once again um, 
in a bit of a different in a bit of bit of a different light this morning. Thank you, thank you, Jan, for leading out in the Sabbath school. Uh, what a great uh, great lesson we're having this quarter on the law of God. And because here we have the Ten Commandments, you know, and the Ten Commandments are just so beautiful. As I'm studying with people, I said, you know, Jesus says says to us that when we come to him, he will set us free. And again, in the perimeters of the Ten Commandments, we are free to live our lives in accordance to his will and in accordance to his Holy Spirit. Ten Commandments, chapter 20, reading from verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And we might think, oh, yeah, but that's, that's nice. You know, and that's referring to way back then when he did lead them out of the um, land of Egypt. But it is more so and just as guilty for us today when we read that particular verse. Because God has led you and I out of Egypt. Egypt being synonymous to sin. He's led us out of our sinful lives. And we are no longer under the bondage of sin. As they were slaves to Egypt, we were slaves to Satan. He's called us out to serve him uh, as free agents uh, in accordance to his will. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take, make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. An interesting commandment, this one, because as, he's, as he mentions that we should not make any likeness, when God created the, the world, he put everything into place, didn't he? He created the, the dry land, he created the waters, he created the heavens, and then from the third day on, he filled it all up. He filled the dry land with people, uh, with uh, animals, uh, the fish in the, wa uh, in the waters, and of course the birds in the air. And of course we were the crown of creation. And he goes on to say in that similar order that you shouldn't have any likeness of any of these things that are put in the water, that are put on the earth, or that are put in the sky to bow down or worship. Because these are also are the sins of the flesh. If you're not worshipping me, you're worshipping someone else. I have a right to be jealous. Amen. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the fourth, third and fourth generation of them that hate me. How many families are suffering because of the sins of their fathers and their grandparents because they've been worshipping false idols? That curse is, has still been on them, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks to one of those people and they're called into the, tr to the truth of the gospel and that's broken. Amen? Of them that hate me. But what another beautiful promise is just tucked there in verse 6. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God bestows a huge amount of mercy upon us because we love him and keep his commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We've all been called into the family of God. And if uh, your children have been born into your family, and if they misrepresent your family in any way, they're taking the name of your family in vain. Another aspect to look at, but also today, this is one of the commandments that are broken every second of the day with that word you hear out of everybody's mouth, OMG. Just blaspheming the Lord of God every day and every second. Marianne brought up a good point. Wouldn't it be terrible if I constantly called you, Gary, every second of the day? I think I'd get a bit upset, a bit frustrated, a bit angry at that, wouldn't you? And yet they're doing it to the God who gave us his son, Jesus Christ, every second of the day, OMG. So if you hear that, please try and correct those young people. And of course, we've uh, touched a lot this morning on, on the Sabbath in our Sabbath school, but for the sake of those that weren't here this morning, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor do all thy work. Yeah, but pastor, yeah, what about the Saturday market? You know, I said, yeah, what about it? The Lord says you've got six days to go get all your fresh vegetables. 
yeah, but it's, it's pretty good down there. And I said, it doesn't matter. The Lord says if we're faithful, he will bless us with vegetables and everything else. Oh, yeah, but um, I've got to go somewhere and I haven't filled up my car. You've had six days to do all that. The sixth day, the, se- the seventh day is for the Lord our God. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do thy work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger within the gates. Yeah, but I could go out and, um, and, and, and take these people out, out, out to dinner and um, on the Sabbath day. I says, no. Didn't you just read what it said in the commandments? Nor your maid or your maidservant. No one else is supposed to work for you on the Sabbath day. So why create employment for them? Nobody is to work on the Lord's seventh day. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath is to be a sign between you and your Lord, Ezekiel 20, that we are his people and that he is our God. Honour thy father and thy mother, that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord hath given thee. Honour thy father and thy mother, what a special promise that is tied into that. We owe our parents a lot, don't we? We owe our parents a huge amount, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. And uh, the way they've fed us and clothed us and a lot of our parents have sacrificed for the fact that we've had to go to college, to go to school, um, to have our education. They've sacrificed just to feed us. Um, maybe not so, so much today, but in some families it's still the case. And there's a promise that our days will be long upon the earth if we're faithful to our Lord, to our mum and dad. Thou shalt not kill. In the original it says thou shalt not murder. Anyone, of course, we don't, we don't do that as Christians at all. But the scripture tells us that if we have in our minds to hate or something against one of our brothers and sisters, it says as if we have murdered them. We have to be so careful, so careful. And we can only be careful with our lives if we're connected with our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And as I mentioned before, this is, a, this is something that's just out there. It's so promiscuous in, in every aspect of people's lives, adultery. Do, you, do they love you? No, they don't. It's just a sexual lust that has been uh, used by the devil to keep people out of a a relationship out of a family relationship and of course it breaks a lot of marriages today thou shalt not steal well that's pretty obviously isn't it we don't do that we don't steal so why should people steal from us but have you done your your income tax lately have you been honest or have you stolen also there you know we've got to be careful in every aspect of our lives as we read that commandment that we're not stealing in every sphere of our lives thou shalt not be a false witness against thy neighbor we are not allowed to discredit anybody's name and we think oh no we don't do that and yet in the church family gossip is one of the biggest things that bears a false witness against thy neighbor and isn't it sad that we can be a false witness through gossip to our brothers and sisters within the family of god thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant nor his maidservant nor his ox nor his ass nor anything that is thy neighbor's yeah well, so, well i haven't got a donkey well yeah that's okay uh, but anything that belongs to your neighbor does not belong to you you can admire it but you don't have to have exactly what they've got the lord says he will look after us and he will bless us and he does he blesses us with with everything that we need, the very clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the Lord, that's all we need. That's all we need. He's blessed us with love. He's blessed us with family and friends. So here we have it. That law was not nailed to the cross. And if we step out in any regards of not keeping that law, we are no longer free. We are guilty of sin, and that's why Jesus was nailed to the cross. That's why Jesus was nailed to the cross. And of course, we can turn that around a bit again 
um, I've just got to find my text in the book of Romans. Let's turn back to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is the law that we've been freed from, the condemnation of the law. The punishment of the law is what we have been freed of. That's the one that has been done away because we are now no longer children of, of Satan. We are children of Jesus Christ. And I just love, uh, again, thank you, Jan, for mentioning that this morning, that robe of righteousness that covers us is so precious. As God the Father looks at our name recorded in the book of life, he just sees Jesus Christ, that wonderful robe of righteousness. Our sins have been blotted out forever. Isn't that something to be thankful for? Amen? Amen. So, brothers and sisters, for the law of this, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. When I am in accordance and in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I am not breaking the law of God. And that's why I'm free to walk in the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, that is my prayer for each and every one of you, to walk and to, to desire these gifts of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, to be loving, to be kind, patient, disciplined, and, uh, and of course, to be full of joy. So as we go into a new week, let us not forget that we are walking in the Spirit of God. Amen.
Dearest Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for your word, Lord, because it is, again, a light unto our path. Father, we just thank you that your word was given to us in, that, in our, the Saviour, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, we not only have Jesus Christ, but we have the power of the Spirit to quicken our souls, Lord, to encourage and to strengthen us on a daily basis. So as we leave your sanctuary today, we ask, Lord, for a special outpouring of your Spirit upon us, that you'll anoint us and baptize us anew, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome to uh, fellowship with us uh, over lunch, so thank you. <laughs>